I want to ask you, Will, now to take your Bibles and join me in Luke chapter 14. Verse 25 is where we'll start reading. If you will, just remain seated for just a moment and we'll, we'll stand. I want to start with, um, with a story about Vera Cruz and about commitment. When the Spanish explorer Cortez, or Cortez is who the story about, landed at Veracruz in 1519 to begin his conquest of Mexico. He had a small force of 700 men. Legend has it that he purpose, purposely set fire to his fleet of 11 ships. Presumably his men on shore watched their only means of retreat sink to the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. There's now only one direction to move forward into the Mexican interior to meet whatever may come their way. That's the commitment a Christian makes when they come to Christ. All means of going back are gone. The ship has been burned. It's at the bottom of the sea. The only way we have now is forward with Christ. Let's stand together as we read Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. Luke 14, 25. Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, Salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless, either for the soil or in, for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's have a word of prayer. Fathers, we continue our time of worship this morning, and we look into your word as we're looking at the cost of discipleship, um, Father, we are, we are fully aware of the cost. We're here because we have already considered the cost. Um, but we just want to take some time to remind ourselves of the cost that has been paid on our behalf and, and what we are giving up in order to gain all of eternity. And so, Father, we pray that you'd lead us through our time of study this morning. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Um, before we start our study of Galatians, we're uh, going to spend a few weeks looking at the church, just doing a little study on the church. Last week, as we began, we, we kind of laid the foundation. We looked at the foundation for the church, 
And one of the things we notice that in Jesus' uh, in his statement to his disciples when he asked them who he was, and Peter made that statement, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. I have to say it that way. Somebody, somebody stressed me, and, and I want you to listen to it. You are the Christ because there's only one Christ. There's only one anointed. The Son, because he's got one begotten Son, of the living God. There is only one living God. That, that was Peter saying, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, and upon that statement, I will build my church. Jesus, the, the church is built with people who make that profession of faith. When you say it that way, though, that sounds so easy. As long as you believe in Jesus, as long as you believe he is the Christ, son of the living God, that, that's it. In many churches today, the approach to becoming a Christian is just say this prayer. And often you'll hear people in evangelism repeat this prayer after me. Have you ever thought about how insincere that is? Ladies, were you proposed to, those of you who are married, were you proposed to? Let me ask a question. If it would have gone like this, would you be married today? If an intercessor would have said, okay, now repeat after me. Pam, Pam, will you be my wife? Will you be my wife? Or would you rather it actually come from the individual that's asking? And yet we'll say, repeat this prayer after me. Well, do they really mean the prayer? They didn't even come up with the words to the prayer. So say this prayer, sign this card, and get baptized. You're in. That's the approach so many churches take to evangelism, church membership, Christianity. Christianity. Say this prayer, sign this card, get baptized, and you're in. Often get things in the mail or email more today, church growth methods that are encouraging you to um, remove anything offensive. You, you want to make the people welcome, you want them feel good, so you, you need to remove anything offensive so people will come. Remove anything that is overly demanding, that, that seems as if there's expectations upon the individual that is coming to Christ. You want to you get rid of all that because they don't want to be overwhelmed. Oh my goodness gracious, there's expectations on me if I'm coming to Christ? In the church today, there, there's uh, this idea that how a Christian lives, how a person becomes a Christian is determined by that individual themselves. They can lay out the terms for coming to Christ. They can lay out the terms of what it means living for Christ after that. It's as if they write up the contract, this is how I'll live, this is what I'll do, Jesus will save me now, Jesus, you sign it. There's my contract. I'll do what I want, how I want, when I want, and Jesus, you'll sign here and you'll be okay with it. You just provide my fire insurance. Folks, that's why we have professing Christians that are loosely asso associated with the church at all, if they are. They either don't come, they're somewhere else this morning, they're shopping or they're enjoying uh, their day, the bright, sun shiny, the bright sunshine we have outside, and yet they're a believer. Maybe they're sleeping in this morning. That's why we have professing Christians that are inactive church members. 
Have you ever thought that through? What exactly is an inactive church member? You ever seen a place of work that had inactive employees? Normally, we used to get rid of those. Or you've got professing Christians that are not church members at all. They just, they're like Tom T. Hall. Them and Jesus got their own thing going. They and Jesus got it all worked out, right? All of these have prayed a prayer. They've been baptized. They may or may not have joined a church. They would claim, if you ask them, yes, I'm saved, and I'm going to heaven when I die, and I'm going because I asked Jesus into my heart, and I really, really meant it the fifth or ninth time that I did it, right? They may even be willing to say, you know, I know I'm not living like I should, but you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. That's in the Bible somewhere. For the most part, many, many churches today are willing to agree with these professing Christians. They're willing to comfort them, encourage them even in their approach to Christianity. Again, we've got to remove anything offensive, right? So we don't, we don't want to upset them by saying, look, you really need to look at this. But Christ's approach to a Christian is somewhat different. The text we just read, our text this morning, is an invitation from Christ to follow him. It doesn't necessarily contain the gospel as you and I are used to hearing the gospel message repentance of sin and, and faith in Christ. But it is a side of the gospel that we don't hear that often. A side of the gospel that perhaps many today have never heard would seem strange to their ears and would, would in fact uh, seem the opposite of what so many in the church today would say, that this is the gospel. This is a side of the gospel that many have said you should never share this. You share this with people and it'll turn them off. It'll turn them away. Now, there are those that look at this text and they say, well, this is not a, a call to follow Christ. This is a call to a deeper commitment. This is not a call to salvation. It's a call to a deeper commitment uh, and not everyone wants to have that deep a commitment to Christ, so not everyone has to abide by this text. It's, uh, you can be a Christian and not go this deep in your walk with Christ. That's what they would say. So let's just kind of examine this text and see if that holds water for a moment. Look with me at what Jesus says in verse 26. Starts off, if, so... Uh, Let's us know right off the bat, this is a conditional phrase. If anyone comes to me, that is a condition. If that condition is met, all right? If that condition is not met is what Jesus is saying. If that condition is not met, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus is saying, if someone comes to me and then he gives a condition, does not love mother and father, or does not hate mother and father, sister, brother, all their life more than me, they cannot be my disciple. The same thing is seen again in verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me, there's the condition. The condition is to carry your own cross if that condition is not met. Once again, Jesus says he cannot be my disciple. And then again, in verse 33, we find a definitive statement. None of you can be my disciple. And then he gives the condition there, who does not give up his, all his own possessions. 
I want you to notice Jesus does not say, does not say in this, this passage, if you want to be more committed to me. He does not say if anyone comes and wants to be more committed to me, he needs to do these things. He does not say, if you want to have a greater relationship and go deeper in your relationship with me, you must meet these conditions. He flat out says, if you do not meet these conditions, you cannot be my disciple. It's not a, it's not a call to a deeper fellowship. It's a call to salvation. In this passage, Jesus is setting forth the cost of following Christ. That sounds a little strange to many ears today in Christianity, doesn't it? We think about the cost of salvation and we think about what Christ did for us. But there's a cost for you. If you're here this morning, look, I know most of you are here this morning. You've, you've considered this cost. You've paid this cost. Uh, we're just kind of reminding you, but I know there are some among us this morning that have never turned to Christ in repentance and faith. And so I want to share with you right now, uh, there is a cost you're going to have to pay. He paid the cost for your sins, but it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something dear if you're going to turn to him in repentance and faith. This is not works that you have to do. It's not works. It's not something you have to do. But it's an attitude. It's, it's a state of mind that a believer must have. It's like that of the man found that found the hidden treasure in Matthew. Matthew 13, 44 and through 46 says this, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. When a man found and which a man found and hid again and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, buys that field. Verse 45, he says, In the kingdom of heaven is like the merchant seeking fine pearls, and upon finding the one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. It's not works, it's an attitude. It's the attitude of saying, you know what, this is so much greater than all of this. I am willing to forsake that for this. It doesn't matter what this cost, I'll get rid of everything for that. Nothing here is willing to, I, I'll hold nothing here to keep me away from that. That's the attitude of a Christian when they see Christ, when they see the depth of their sin, when they see the fact that an eternity in hell waits on the other side, and yet Christ has provided salvation. Nothing here, nothing of value here holds them away from that. They'll get rid of all of this for that. That's the attitude of a Christian. That is what Christ is setting before us here in this passage. The, cross, the, the cost of following Christ. A couple words I want us to examine before we begin looking at this passage and, and going through it. First is that word disciple. It's methetes. It occurs 269 times in the New Testament. It means a learner or a pupil. Rabbis had disciples. People that would follow them around, that would follow their teaching. That's why Jesus was called a disciple, because people followed him. They followed his teaching. Now, he wasn't trained as a, a rabbi, but he had disciples. That's why he was called a rabbi. Jesus calls them his disciples. Here's the unique thing about it. The rabbi determines what is required to be a disciple. The disciple does not say, I will give you this and I will follow you. The rabbi says, to follow me, you must do this. That's what Jesus is doing in this passage. If you're going to be my disciple... 
this is what is required of you. He determines what disciples look like. He determines what uh, disciples act like, what they believe. If an individual lives or acts or believes contrary to what the master teaches and the way the master lives, the teacher does not claim them as his disciples. It doesn't matter what the disciple claims. And what the, dis what the teacher claims is much more important than what the disciple says. That's why in John 8, 31, we read, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who believed in him, If you continue in my words, then you are truly my disciples. He's, the, he's, setting, out for, he's setting forth what it means to be his disciple. A true disciple is one that obeys the words of Christ, the word of God. In Luke, uh, in Luke, in, in Acts chapter 11, we get another glimpse of a, a disciple. We get another name for a disciple anyway. Acts eleven twenty six 26 says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. We don't call ourselves necessarily disciples today. We call ourselves Christians. But when you look in Scripture, a Christian is a disciple of Christ. And Jesus is the one that determines what a Christian is. He's the one that determines what a disciple is. But one more word I want us to look at real quick. And that's the word cannot. It's a compound word. It means not and can. Pretty hard, right? The word not there means never. Certainly not, not at all, and not by any means. And then the word can is to be able to have the power, to, to be able to or have the power, the ability, the resources. And so when Jesus says cannot, he's saying by no means do you have the ability. By no means are you able to. And then back to our word disciple. By no means can you be my disciple. What he is saying is if you do not meet these conditions, you cannot by any means, no power of your own, certainly not be my disciple. Three things I want us to notice this morning as we look at the cost of following Christ. Three things we're going to draw out of this text. Number one, it is a total commitment. Second, we're going to look at the fact that it needs to be a well-thought-out commitment. And finally, we'll look at the fact that it must be an enduring commitment. So let's begin. Number one, following Christ is a total commitment. We see that in verses 26, 27, and 33. Christ is calling for a total commitment. He says to those who would come to Christ, in verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Christ is saying he must be the greatest priority in regards to relationships. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers, Christ must be priority in our relationships. Now, look, let's look at the word hate a, minute, a moment. That's kind of difficult, is it not? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own brother and sister and mother, mother and sister and brother and father and uh, everyone, Does Christ really mean we should hate our parents? Is Christ really saying we should hate our brothers and sisters? <laughs> Folks, there's enough commands in Scripture that we're to love one another. There's enough commands in Scripture that we are to love each other. We're to be like Christ and love one another. We know, we know, we don't even have to look too deep into this. He does not mean actual hate here. 
But what he is saying is if your love for them, if your love for me doesn't make your love for them look like hate, it's not enough. If you do not prefer me so much over anything else, it, the relationship's wrong. If you can't let go of your mother and father, for me, you don't love me enough. If you can't let go of your husband or wife, if you can't let, if you can't let go of me for your children, if you can't let go of your children for me, you cannot be my disciple. All of a sudden, the cost got high, didn't it? Because look, in, in this day, that was something that may happen if you choose to follow Christ. In his day, if you chose, I am going to, I'm going to forsake my Jewish heritage. I'm going to forsake my Judaism. And I'm going to follow this man because he is the Christ, the son of the living God. I'm going to follow him. You would have cut off all relationships that you had with your parents, your children, your wife, everyone. They would have cut off from you. They, they would have had nothing to do with you. They would have put you outside of society. It was a high cost. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to be willing to do that. You're going to have to be willing to endure that. We cannot have a relationship that is of a higher priority than our relationship with Christ. Christ must come first. Folks, we do love our families. We would do anything for them. That's one of the reasons why we share the gospel with our lost family members. We would do anything for them. We do everything we can for them. But if anyone in our family ever come to us and said, it's either Christ or me, the decision's already made, it's Christ. Christ wins. If something or anyone that ever calls us to make a choice between serving Christ and, and our families, Christ wins. For the believer, this, this decision is already made. It's sort of like uh, the decision James Calvert tells, uh, a story about James Calvert, he, who was a missionary. When he went out to be a missionary, he went to um, the Fiji Islands where there were a bunch of cannibals. The captain of the ship that was carrying him there, the entire trip was trying to encourage him not to go. Told him it's too dangerous. Tried to, get him encouraging, tried to encourage him to turn back. He said, if you go, you will lose your life and the life of everyone you take with you if you go among those savages. And Calvert replied by saying, we died before we came here. That's the attitude of a Christian. You make me make this choice, I've already made it years ago. It's him. If you bring me to the, to the point where I have to make a decision between you and him, it's him. That's the decision we make before we come to Christ. Not when the time comes. That's the decision we make before we come to him. Christ is to be given priority over all relationships, but not only relationships, but our desires and dreams too. Look at the end of verse 26. Yes, even your own life. It's not just the relationships we have with people. It's, it's everything we have in life. Our dreams, our desires, what we want out of life. If we're not willing to forfeit that, and folks, sometimes as Christians, we must, mustn't we? The things we want in life, our commitment to Christ comes in contradiction with those things. And we either forfeit Christ or we forfeit the, our dreams and our desires. We forfeit our life. Often here, People say, well, God knows that I have a life. He understands that I cannot serve him now. I've got other things to do. I can't go to church now. I've got other things. I've got to live my life now. You know what God understands? That we must submit to him. 
That, that's what he understands. There are those whose attitude toward God is that God is there to come alongside me. This is my plan. This is what I want to do. And I'm just going to bring God along with me to do this. But that's not how God works. We come alongside God. We join him in his will. We follow him after his plan. What Christ is saying here is that those who will follow him must be willing to abandon their, their dreams, to give up their desires in order to serve him. The gospel call is not an invitation to add Jesus to your life. It is a call to submit to Christ, to taking over your life. Additionally, a disciple of Christ must esteem Christ so highly that we're willing to die for our commitment to him. In verse 27, he says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Those hearing Christ that day would have been very familiar with the cross. They would have seen Roman crosses on the sides of the roads going into town. Anytime someone had, had rebelled against Rome, Rome had a method of putting that down, and that was the cross. They would crucify that individual. They would hang them on the cross. They would leave them on the side of the road, and it was a message to everybody. You cross Rome, this is what you get. Stay in line. Obey us. Do what we say. Now, this would have been shocking to those that Christ is talking to because look, this is a violent, ugly form of death. And when Christ said, whoever comes after me and does not carry his own cross, carry your own cross. Look, you know who carried the cross? Not the Roman soldiers, the individual dying. If you were carrying a cross, you were on your way to die. The sentence had already been handed down. You were as good as dead, dead man walking. And that's what Christ is saying. If you're not willing to give up your life for your commitment to me, you cannot be my disciple. We often think, well, it's only missionaries who have that kind of commitment. They, you know, they're going into those jungles in Fiji or they're going somewhere like that. They're the ones that have to have that kind of commitment to Christ. Christ is saying, if you don't have that kind of commitment, you cannot be my disciple. Not only our life, though, our relationships, our desires, our dreams, our life. But Christ is also saying that our love for him must be such a high priority that we're given, willing to give up all that we possess. Verse 33, he says, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. This is not a command to get rid of them. He's not saying, if you're coming to me, you have to get rid of everything you have. But what he is saying is, if you come to me, it might cost you everything you have, and you need to be willing to let go. It might cost you everything. Don't be holding on to it. Be willing to let it go. We see very clearly in all four of these areas, your relationships, your, your dreams, your desires, your life, your possessions, if you're not willing to sacrifice those on behalf of Christ, if, if those are more important to you than Christ, Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple. The cost of being a follower of Christ is extremely high. It is a total commitment. A Christian's commitment is to be like the pig in the story about the hen and the pig. On, they were traveling one day and passed by a church. They approached the church sign, and the church sign said, Sermon topic, what can we do to help the poor? Immediately, the hen suggested that they feed them bacon and eggs. The pig thought for a moment and said, there's only one thing wrong with feeding them bacon and eggs to the poor. For you, it requires only a contribution. For me, it requires total commitment. 
It's everything, folks. If we're coming to Christ, it's not a contribution. It's a total commitment. He gets it all. Or we can't come. But that leads us straight into this second thing I want us to consider. Like, that's a high cost, is it not? That, that, that's a high cost. Everything. It could cost you every single, every relationship you have, every dream you have, every possession you've got. It could cost your very life. That is a high commitment. And that's why it's a commitment that ought to be well thought out. Look with me in verses 28 through 32. He says there, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and can calculate the cost? In verse 31, or what king, when he sets out to meet another king <clears throat> in battle, does, will not first determine whether he consider whether he can face that king? Decisions. Uh, uh, there's a calculation here. We often hear, hear um, you, you, need to, you need to come to Christ. You need to come to Christ now. The purpose that many, the reason many churches give altar calls after sermons is because you've got to come now. You've you got to come right this moment. And so we're going to open up this altar and you come down here and say this prayer. That's the purpose behind emotionally charging those altar calls and, and playing on people's emotions. Listen, emotion, get the emotions going where you just have to. You just have to come down here and say the prayer because it's got to be done and it's got to be done now. Well, there is a sense of urgency, all right? Paul, quoting Isaiah, says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Look, we don't know if we get the next minute or not. I do not know whether I will make it to 1135 or if I'll die of a heart attack right here. I don't know that. You don't know. So there is a sense of urgency. But that does not necessitate a hasty decision. It should be a well-thought-out decision. Salvation is the most important decision a person will ever make. The most, you, there, there's nothing else you can, can, can think more about, nothing of more value that you can determine. It is a decision that should be well thought out. Jesus gives us two examples here to demonstrate this, per, this point. First, it's a man who is seeking to build a tower. Now, look, you've got to keep in mind this is an honor society. They were afraid of being shamed. They did not want to be shamed. You see that over and over as we go through both the Old Testament and New Testament. There, there, there are so many things that a person wouldn't do because it brings shame on them. The, the story of the prodigal son, the reason a, a man doesn't pull up and gird his loins, the reason he didn't run, because it might expose his legs and that was shameful, okay? Th this is a shame society that they, they feared being shamed. And can you think, can, um, think for a moment with me, how many times do you pass a house today or maybe a place of business they started building something and because of our economy they hadn't been able to finish it uh, the Jews would have been so ashamed with that you got to be ready to finish when you start that's the point here Jesus is saying for which one of you wants to build a tower does not first sit down and calculate to see to the cost to see if he has enough to complete it Then the second one, the king, that's, he, the king is being threatened, and then now he's got to sit down and say, all right, I've got 10,000 soldiers. He's got 20,000 soldiers. Can I defeat him? Not just fight him. Can I defeat him with my 10,000 against his 20,000, or do I need to go and ask for peace? He's got to think about this. So here's, the, here's how we tie it to... Jesus' message of salvation. The cost of salvation is your life. Everything. 
When you surrender your life to Christ, that's exactly what you're doing. You are surrendering your life. That's one side of the cost. If you choose not to surrender to Christ, that's the other side. And I want to say this, that side's much higher. Because if you choose not to surrender to Christ, all who refuse to surrender to Christ will suffer the wrath of an almighty God for all of eternity. To, to determine that you're going to hold on to your life and not submit to Christ is to say, I will endure the penalty for my sin. I will suffer the wrath of an almighty God for all of eternity with no hope of ever receiving grace or mercy. The choice of surrender hinges on your sin. If you surrender to Christ, he gets your life and your sin. You get his life and an eternity in heaven. If you choose not to surrender to Christ, you keep your sin, you keep your life, and you get the wrath of God for all of eternity. This is a choice you need to make, and you need to make it now, but you need to think through it because it's a high cost either way. In fact, it will cost you your life one way or the other. The cost of following Christ is a total commitment. It is a commitment that needs to be thought out. But finally, it's an enduring commitment too. Verses 34 and 35 in, in a lot of our Bibles, this is a new paragraph. It is in mine. Some, it has a completely different heading. Uh, but I want you to notice these tie together. Notice the very first word in verse 34, therefore. That means it's pointing right back to what he just said. So this ties in with what he's been saying. He says, therefore, salt is good. But if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. Is to be thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Seems to be an impossible statement. What in the world is he talking about here? Salt can't, salt cannot lose its tasteness. In, in Jesus' day, salt was used for so many different things. It was a preservative, and, and that's why he says you are the salt of the earth. It was a preservative. They'd pack meat in it. They'd pack all kind of things in it, and the salt would preserve uh, the meat so that it could be later. They didn't have refrigeration like we do, like we do in here this morning, right? They didn't have refrigeration, and so they had to use the salt to, to preserve the meat. That is what a Christian is to do. We are to preserve the Christian, the Christ-likeness in our society. We are to preserve a Christ-like attitude. We are to preserve a Christ-like life in our society. It doesn't matter what, doesn't matter the decay all around us. It doesn't matter the rottenness all around us. We preserve Christ-likeness. It's also used uh, as, as a fertilize. That sounds weird, doesn't it? Salt kills grass, and yet I want you to look up your fertilizer and see how much is made out of sodium. It all is. It's used to fertilize and help things grow. Well, that, that's one of the things we do with one another. We, we fertilize one another. We are the salt that helps one another grow. But he also mentions it being on the manure pile. You throw it on the manure pile, it helps it decompose faster. It's gone faster. It, it gets rid of what is bad. And, folks, that's one of the things we do with one another. We help one another get rid of the things in life that don't belong here. We, we call one another accountable. But we do that in life, too. We're, as we're calling people to repentance and faith, we're calling them out of the manure pile. Those are things salt was useful, but there is a certain salt that comes out of the Dead Sea 
that could be mixed with another chemical and all of a sudden it lost its effectiveness. It lost its taste. It didn't even taste like salt anymore. It, it couldn't be thrown on the manure pile and help decay things. It was no good at fertilize anymore. And so Jesus said it's just good to be thrown at. It, it's, it's worthless. And here he's talking about the individual that, that, that claims to be the Christian and yet doesn't preserve Christ's likeness. Doesn't seek to overcome uh, the wickedness in the world. Doesn't seek to shine forth. Doesn't seek to preserve the Christ-like uh, attitude and Christ-like life in this world. Doesn't seek to lead others to Christ. He's saying this individual's profession is worthless. It can just be thrown out. That's all it's good for. When we come to Christ, we are giving ourselves to Him to be used by Him to reach the lost, to help one another grow, to grow ourselves, to be salt and light in this world, to have that type of impact. But a professing Christian that does not have that type of impact is useless, good for nothing. That is how we're to live our life. It, it's, it's, this salt lost its saltiness. We're not to, look, we know we can't lose our salvation. We're not talking about people who were saved and lost their salvation. But we're talking about people who are not, who are not willing to make that commitment. They have not gone through this, this change. They've never been regenerated. They've never been transformed. They're making a profession but having no impact. I want to close with an illustration right quick. On August 11th, 1978, Double Eagle II, a large helium balloon and her crew of three eased into an almost windless sky above the potato fields of Maine. Their destination was Paris, France. The aerodynamics of the balloon, of ballooning, are, are somewhat complex, but one thing is certain. In order for the balloon to stay aloft, as the journey progressed, ballast, that which is used to add weight, had to be expelled. As they approached continental Europe six days later, one of the crew wrote, we have expanded ballast wisely, but, we, but as we near land, not cheaply. Over went such gear as tape recorders, radios, film magazines, sleeping bags, lawn chairs, most of our water, food, and the cooler that it was in. Following Christ is the wisest choice a man can make, but it does not come cheap. Just as these balloonists made many, made many important decisions and threw many things away, abandoned many things, in order to be a Christian, we must do the same thing. Now, here's the, here's the thing about that story. They made it to Paris, France. Losing those things didn't cost them anything. It kept their life. Christian, here's, here's the truth that you and I know. We're not surrendering anything of great value. Not considering Christ. When we consider Christ and the glories that we have in him and the glories we have for all of eternity, we are not surrendering anything of great value. But to not surrender it is a terrible loss, is a tragic loss. So I would encourage you, Christian, that this morning I want to encourage you. <laughs> Just remind yourself, yep, I, made this, I made this commitment. 
And it was the right one. It was a wise decision. It was a wise choice. I got the value. I got the greatest value. But those of you here this morning that may not, you may have never turned to Christ to repentance and faith, let me remind you. You might have your life now. And you may hold on to your life. But the cost is more than you want to pay. The cost of life here and now is more than you want to pay in eternity. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, as we conclude our time together this morning, Father, we are so grateful that those of us who have come to you in repentance and faith, we are thankful that you helped us understand <laughs> that you regenerated our hearts, you regenerated our minds, you gave us understanding, you helped us to see the glory in Christ, you helped us to see the wickedness of sin, you helped us to see what we were turning away from, you gave us the wisdom necessary to come to you. And so we are, we are thankful for that, we are eternally grateful. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to daily surrender to you our life, daily surrender to you all our dreams and desires, trusting you for uh, your grace and your mercy. We pray for those among us this morning that, um, Father, they haven't, they've never come to you in repentance and faith. Lord, we pray quickly they will see, quickly they will come to an understanding of just how wonderful Christ is and the great value in Christ and the danger of holding on to their life. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather for worship this morning. We thank you for those who are here. We thank you for those who are joining us on our live stream. And Just pray that you'd go with us throughout the remainder of the day. In the wonderful name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.